This is the last video in our series on invertebrate diversity. In this video, we'll take a look at the deuterostome branch of the coelomates. We will discuss the phylum Echinodermata and introduce the chordates. We have been working our way through the animal kingdom and we're now to the deuterostome branch of the coelomates. Before we go any further, we need to remind ourselves what makes an animal deuterostome. To do this, we need to go back to our discussion on animal development. Remember, when we discussed animal development, we talked about the hollow ball cells rolling in on itself in a process of gastrulation in order to create the primitive gut, or the archenteron. The opening to this cavity is called the blastopore. The fate of this blastopore gives us the names protostome or deuterostome. If, as we continue development, this digestive cavity as it keeps continues to form, if the blastopore eventually becomes the mouth, then we call these animals protostomes, or first mouth, protostome. In contrast, in the deuterostome branch, this blastopore eventually becomes the anus, and the second opening to the digestive cavity becomes the mouth, and we call these animals deuterostomes, or second mouth. So, we're on the deuterostome branch, and we'll start with the phylum Echinodermata. The name Echinodermata means spiny skin and includes animals such as sea urchins, sand dollars, and starfish. The first thing we should notice about the Echinoderms is they seem fairly simple. They exhibit radial symmetry. Previously, we've noted radial symmetry as being a, a primitive feature. In our travels through the animal kingdom, we left radial symmetry behind way back here with the Cnidarians. But here we see it has evolved again in the Echinoderms. However, if we investigate a bit more, we see that this radial symmetry is only present in the adult form. During the larval stages of development, the Echinoderms exhibit bilateral symmetry, which indicates that they evolved from a bilateral ancestor. Another feature of animals that we know is linked with symmetry is the presence or absence of a head or cephalization. Where do we concentrate the sensory and feeding structures in an animal that's radial? There's no logical or optimal place in an animal that has no definitive front or back to locate these structures. So in the echinoderms, or in the adult echinoderms, cephalization is lacking. Let's take a look at a few more features of the echinoderms using the starfish as an example. Starfish are carnivores. They're slow-moving scavengers with their mouths located on the underside of their body. You can't see it in this diagram, but their mouth is underneath. And the anal pore is here at the top. So they have a very short digestive system. The food's taken in from underneath. There's a stomach in here, and then the wastes are removed through the anus. There's not a lot of room for complex systems in this kind of flat, spread out animal. So they have to locate a lot of the organs down, packed away in their arms. The echinoderms use the spines on their skin Oops. Let's, let me pick this up again. The spines on their skins as uh, gills for gas exchange. They don't have a dedicated circulatory system, though fluid in this chamber, in this body cavity, will help move materials through their body. They have a unique system of suction cup tube feet. Uh, I did it again. Tube feet that they use to move about to grasp their prey. We do see for the first time in the echinoderms a simple endoskeleton. Uh, it's a ridge of calcified, uh, 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 well, calcified ridge that supports each of these uh, legs, and it allows for a site for muscle attachment as well as giving it the animal a little bit of internal structural support. We can see there's an advantage to having an endoskeleton versus an exoskeleton. Uh, it allows the skeleton to grow with you from the inside. We can contrast that with what we saw in the uh, orthopods and the hard exoskeleton, which would have to be molted uh, occasionally in order to let the organism grow. And that brings us to the last of our phyla in the animal kingdom, the phylum chordata. You, as a human, are a chordate. So what qualifies an, animals, an animal to be a chordate? To be classified as a chordate, an animal must have each of the following at some point in its life. 
a notochord, a strong flexible rod-like structure that runs the length of the dorsal surface. Many times the notochord is replaced by vertebrae. I'm going to the color. I'm going to use blue here. So the notochord is oftentimes replaced by a backbone in uh, many of the chordates, but it gives the animal some rigid uh, structural support to build their body off of. A dorsal nerve cord. This is a nerve cord that forms from ectoderm and it gives rise eventually to a brain and the spinal cord. Gill slits. Paired openings in the walls of the pharynx or the throat. This is where the gills are going to reside for gas exchange uh, and in some chordates it acts as a filter feeding structure. And finally all chordates at some point in their development have a tail. Now, thinking of this, and you you being a chordate as a human, you don't have a notochord. In humans, the notochord is replaced by a vertebrae, a bony uh, backbone. Your dorsal nerve cord is your spinal cord in your brain. You don't have gill slits, but in your embryonic development stages, you had openings in your throat where the gill slits were. And you don't have a tail, but you do have a remnant tail bone. So all chordates have these characteristics at some point in their life or in their developmental stages, but many times one or more of these traits is lost as we mature. So that's what it takes to be a chordate, but what are chordates? Well, in the kingdom, uh, in the kingdom animalia, in the phylum chordata, we have three subphyla, the urochordata, the cephalochordata, and the vertebrata. Now the urochordata and the cephalochordata we could call the invertebrate chordates. These C squirts or urochordata do not look very much like the rest of the, the chordates, certainly don't look like the vertebrates. And the cephalochordates are a very generic chordate. And then we're going to move in our next unit into a look at the diversity of the vertebrates, which include all of the fish, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, and of course the mammals. In our next unit, in our next series of videos, since we've worked our way up all the way to the chordates, we're going to spend time zooming in on the, one, on the chordate phylum itself, more specifically concentrating on the vertebrates. We're going to work our way up through the vertebrate subphylum, through the fish, amphibians, birds, reptiles, and finally mammals. So this is what we have to look forward to in our next unit and our next series of videos.